Welcome to Leaders in Lending. I'm your host, Jeff Keltner. This week's conversation is with Ted Cruz, the SVP and Director of Consumer Finance at Flagstar Bank. Uh, this conversation is pretty wide ranging. Ted and I talked about uh, his thoughts around building a product agnostic experience and really beginning with the consumer's needs and desires and not so much leading with product, which I think has been a very typical thing in the world of consumer finance. Um, we talked about uh, digital transformation and, and Ted's belief that digital transformation needs to really start with the process and not the kind of front end or user experience, user design, but really how do you transform a process, which is sort of a, an emerging theme in my conversations. Uh, and also the critical nature of building the right data layer to enable the right processes to really deliver a superior experience where you can take advantage of the information you already know about a customer in terms of building the best experience for them when they come back uh, for more information or new products. And finally, Ted has one of the most uh, interesting and measurable bold predictions. So if you stick around to the end of the conversation, uh, that's a pretty fun one to listen to. So enjoy the conversation. Ted, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate your, your joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I'm, it's exciting now. I've got listeners who've actually heard the podcast before they come. So that's like a new thing as we go. But you know a little bit more of what to expect. So you get a little bit more of a head start than the, the first sets of guests. Absolutely. Re really great insights. And so I, I really enjoy the podcast well, for sure. Well, that's the bar for today too then. So yeah, if you think <laughs> they've been great insights, you got to provide a few. Um, I, I wanted to start the conversation. We were talking in advance and you use this phrase product agnostic. Um, that I thought was really interesting uh, about how you think about interacting with consumers and, and product development. Uh, help me understand what you mean by being more product agnostic. Yeah, so uh, you know, when when we are looking at our customer set, we want to provide them um, solutions that are for what they need in in their life, what's happening, and mm -hmm. it shouldn't really matter the product, right? Today in in banking and lending, right? It's very much, you need a home equity, like tap that. You already got your first mortgage. Um, oh, you just need this to buy, you know, uh, a car. Here's your car loan, right? It's mm -hmm. very specific to that product and we're trying to give them that product. We're, we're trying to build, and what we are building is to sit back and say, we, we don't, we're gonna build the product so that it doesn't really matter which one you choose. What we're really focused on is that the customer gets what they want, right? And um, there's a really good um, FinTech Takes newsletter from Alex Johnson over at uh, Cornerstone Advisors. Mm -hmm. And it hit, hit home for me what he was focused on there, right? It's not life stage marketing, which kind of happens a lot. Like, oh, it's a home equity, but you could use it for all these things. Mm -hmm. But it's really life stage products, right? Identify the need. Um, we should really be product agnostic. You know, consumers don't want the products. They want the thing. They want the money or the lending or the bank account for, you know, the nice place to live, their ability to buy stuff, ability to store money, you know, maybe get mm -hmm. things they can't quite afford and, you know, not just have, oh, I need a home equity. They, they don't even know that a lot of the time. So that's what we're really focused on here at the bank and especially on the lending side. It's a bit like the old phrase, nobody wants a quarter inch drill, they, they just want a quarter inch hole. That's uh, right. And exactly we're always right. trying to sell them. Just my old sales training, I guess, kicking in. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it, it feels like it goes a step farther than that because a lot of times they don't even know that they want the hole. They know they want piece of furniture or whatever the whole is a part of building. How do you think about that playing itself out in terms of the way you interact with customers, the way you train staff, the way you build digital experiences? I think so much of our technology infrastructure in our processes are built around pick the product and then I know what to do. And we go to a website for any bank and it's like loans, categories of loans. It's very product oriented. So I get the product agnostic, but how do you like really implement like on a website or in a branch experience, what that means in terms of how you actually lead the conversation and figure out, you know, where that consumer needs to go. Um, well, first off, it's, you got to have that data up front as much as you can, right? Obviously a new customer, you might not, but for your existing customers, you already have a wealth of information that you've just got to pull together to then say, I already know these things about you. And, and even take a step further, what we're trying to get to is, Hey, customer or uh, a client coming into the bank, opt in. Let us use you. Let us use your data um, and append that with other third-party data to really get full insights. And so, mm -hmm. when you're coming into the website or you're coming into the bank, um, we already have the knowledge about you and and mm -hmm. pretty much what your needs are, right? And it, again, it's product diagnostic. You come in, and we we know pretty much with a couple of questions, what your need is, and we can mm -hmm. find that solution right away really quickly. And to your point, 
the, fu the funnel shouldn't be, okay, I need a home equity or a personal loan, and you kind of go through this process. The process has to be part of that whole experience too, right? Mm. Um, it, it has to be, you know, we talk about digital transformation and a lot of these companies, they really focus on that customer experience. But to me, what's lacking is that whole process through is the customer experience too, right? How you're getting the mm -hmm. loan, are you leveraging that data to not have to collect things, to not have to ask more questions and are you doing it as fast as possible? And it doesn't matter the product, right? Lending is lending and, you know, People always think of lending as like paper and money, but it's really just mm. data, right? All it is is taking data, trading data, and making good decisions on what you have in front of you. So. Lending is just data. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that in the future for sure. It that's is. A, that's a nice <laughs> phrase. Yeah. Uh, I will say. Um, well, I, I want to go back and just dig a little bit more. Like, does that mean you're? Are you putting like chat interfaces, or how do you envision that kind of? helping the consumer find their way from a need to a product really, really taking place. I can imagine it in a branch with employees who are getting smarter about like not saying, Hey, what, what product are you here for? Like what, what can I help you get today? But kind of like, what, what are you trying to do? Right. My the wealth advisors are probably in this space or, or financial advisors and like, Hey, when do you want to retire? And what are your spending goals for retirement? And here's how much you need. And here's the, you know, you got an IRA or a 401k or they're, they're used to kind of not starting with the product, but maybe starting with like, Hey, what, what is it you want to get to and how do we get there? Is, is it a similar journey you're thinking about on the lending side that you, Hey, I'm looking to build a pool or I'm looking to whatever. And is that how you've envisioned that both in a technology enabled sense and in a, in a people powered sense? Yeah, exactly. I, I think that that's definitely part of it, but to have the, the, the data and that full insight on the customer is really powerful to have those conversations, right? You're just more informed. You're not asking like, well, how much money do you need? What do you, what can you afford? You, you kind of have that up front. So, so based on what you know about them, it really, you can tailor that solution and, you know, solution mm -hmm. selling to that customer, whether they're coming through the branch, a digital channel on the phone, you, you know, you're kind of, again, agnostic to how they come into your bank bank or your lending institution and you're really focused on how do I feel that need that the customer wants because once they feel that and they know that they're going to come back for the next thing they need and the next thing right and it's not mm -hmm. going to feel like hey I'm pushing you on a mortgage or I'm pushing you on a unsecured loan because you just you don't need that much money and it's quicker mm -hmm. right um, it, it's really got to be tailored to what you know about them and then focused on providing that product no matter what it is and and if you build it right then it won't matter right now you said the word data a few times and yep. i'm curious how you think about investing in data infrastructure um because I, I feel like one of the one of the things i hear from a lot of financial institutions is that their data just i mean not only is their consumer experience siloed in products but their systems and data are often similarly siloed within products that support different systems but then don't give that 360 view. Not everybody has access to every system. I got to go four plates. It's kind of like my phone call. I call into the bank. They're like, oh, you want to talk about this product? We're going to, let me transfer you to the person. What they really mean is the person who can access the system that to actually understand what the heck you're talking about because I can't see it. Um, how do you think about the data infrastructure or the way you go about breaking the mold of a kind of product siloed data environment so that you're making that 360 view uh, of a consumer available to your bankers in real time? Yeah, it's it, it's definitely a challenge. It's one that that um, you know we we are fighting through every day, right? It, it's definitely a lot of these core systems are very old. Um, some of them just don't have that um, data flow and that data connectivity that you need, right? So you, you really have to kind of build a centralized piece to feed those in, and then append that with other third party data, right? Data mm -hmm. you might not have on the customer, but when you think of hey, we're we're a big mortgage shop, we have all this mortgage data we have all the data about you know the banking accounts the business banking mm -hmm. accounts the commercial loans like it, it it comes to a point where it's consumer commercial mortgage right you, you shouldn't even the channel is kind of you, you have to start mm -hmm. at the base level of not even thinking about the channel it's really like everything the product process that you have and the products have to be built on that data foundation and it's hard it's it's tough work and the people that are going to get there are really going to succeed, I think. Yeah, I tend to agree. See, I mean, you kind of describe that as a 
pulling out into an independent data layer almost because I mean it does seem like if I take all the systems I have and do a point to point connection for every one like that's an n by n matrix it seems to get very large in terms of connection points very Absolutely. rapidly. So yeah. do you see that as kind of like a separate layer that runs across systems where you're actually trying to interchange and make data available or how, how do you actually like facilitate that kind of capability? Cause it, it feels like it's very powerful and to be frank, not something I see at least from my, the consumer experience, I don't see many people delivering on that uh, particularly well across the institution. So I'm curious your thoughts on how you actually like execute that vision. Yeah. Um, like I said, it, it, it's tough, but you have to kind of start at, at the base and almost start from scratch from what pull all those data sources together and then have one source of truth across the entire organization, no matter what it is, and have that mm -hmm. set of standards and foundation that any of those systems can plug into, whether it's your CRM, you know, your front end banking core, your servicing system, and they, they, they can all see that information on the customer and build those profiles and start really mm -hmm. at that base customer level. Yeah, so. that, that universal source of truth is... Uh, it's not, tough, but if you yeah. get there, like that's the, that's the ticket for sure. And then the other part I want to, I want to delve into a little bit is you talked about, you know, digital transformation, starting with process. It feels like that data layer is foundational to making that happen, but then you've actually got to think about how do we build the right set of processes on top of these layers of data. Um, so I'm curious how you think about that in a, you know, cross product way, you're trying to be product agnostic, or you, you think about like one solution, do you think about independent ways of leveraging it for different products? Um, how you, you know, like, how do you go about then actually designing processes to leverage that data and that capability in intelligent ways? And then I have a follow on question so you can start thinking about it, which is kind of like, how do you bring the institution along? Because I feel like one of the hardest things to change in a financial institution are the processes and procedures and policies that have been your controls. and. Uh, many of the things that you can automate now are not automated because the policy says you're going to do the non-automated thing. So how do you think about building the right processes from scratch? And then how do you think about bringing the institution on board with, you know, allowing you to innovate in the process area where maybe that's how we think of risk controls and, you know, I don't want to say death by committee, but there could be a lot of committees that have some perspective uh, on, you know, not asking for a W-2 for a kind of loan as a simple example. And you go, ah, we got the bank statements. We don't need a W-2. And you go, ah. No, we've always asked for three years of W-2s. Well, right. you know, like, what, 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 how do you resolve that, you know, across the institution and get, you know, get support for driving towards a new direction? So it's a big two-part question. I apologize. Yeah, no, no that's good. They're great questions. Um, so obviously model governance is pieces of it. You have to have the mm -hmm. right models to do that predictability around the risk mm -hmm. and the risk profile and the customers and all that. That's kind of separate, right? But I always view digital transformation. It, it people always tend to start out with the customer experience, right? But mm -hmm. the back end and the way to get them whatever that product or service is, to me, is the main part of the experience, right? That's where the most yeah. friction is, is, oh, I have to give you this piece of information or I have to sign mm -hmm. this document or give you this disclosure. And, and to really take the data and remove those pieces of that part, like, hey, I've already got this piece. I've already got your income. I see how much you spend. I know your mm -hmm. payments, right? It's all, you know, I think we all know, right? The underwriting now is is cash flow underwriting. It's here. That's all mm -hmm. we're doing. We're not looking in the past. We're looking at the now kind of trending of what we think the future is going to be for that customer. And then being able to give them that product that we, you know, product or service that we saw right at, right in the get-go. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Your uh, description reminds me of whenever I talk to our design team here at Upstart, and they get very upset if you call them like UI designers, because in their mind, UI is like the color of the button, the rounding of the corner. And not, not that they don't do that and appreciate the aesthetics, but the difference between that and what they call UX, which is, to your point, the like, what questions am I asking? And when am I asking them? And why? And how do I not ask those questions when I don't? Like, that's a different, deeper thing. And, and I do think too many digital transformations are focused on the, the UI. I've got a website that takes, the, that takes the app, and then I go back to my old process, uh, uh, you yeah. know, and have you come into the branch or just ask you for the same 25 documents I used Still to ask for. sign here, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, actually, I did. I, I'll tell the story. I, I had a bank that called me and said, hey, we got it. We did a digital auto loan. I said, oh, that's awesome. How'd you do it? And they, they all closed in branch with the wet sig. And I said, 
you and I have just different definitions of digital, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's not a digital loan to me if you got to come in branch. And, and so I think there is a focus often on the, you know, the first page of the experience, the, and the, the kind of quality of the look and feel of the front end versus the quality of the overall and the simplicity of the overall end to end for the consumer, which to your point, I think is, is much more powerful. You, there's much more benefit um, to that optimizing the whole process than just the, the look and feel. Totally. Do you have, are there any processes you're proud of that you guys have kind of like undergone renovation and said, Hey, this is one where we actually were able to take out a bunch of steps, a bunch of friction. Is that more directional for you? Are there a few examples of wins you have that you, you could highlight? Um, yeah, I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic, right. A lot of the mm-hmm. digital signing capabilities that really changed the game for us. I think, um, where we weren't as, um, driving maybe the customers to that piece first and just mm-hmm. kind of allowing them to pick and choose. And, and that's totally their choice, but that's really the, the, what I think is the real friction piece. It's like, Oh, you went through all of this and now you got to sign all these documents. Right. So we really put in place ways to make it really quick, like sign these, you know, five spots, four spots and yep. we're good to go. Right. We can kind of finish that later and, and go on with the process and fund your loan. Um, so I'm pretty proud about that. I think to your, yeah. to your piece about how do you bring the organization along and how do you kind of bring risk and your other partners? Um, you know, we have to bring the regulators and our risk partners along. Yep. A lot of that is showing them the data. I think a perfect example, you know, upstart unsecured lending, right? A lot of people deem that risky. Like, oh, you know, we've bought, <laughs> we've bought portfolios. We have organic originations. And, you know, you kind of think of what's a catastrophic type event where, you know, you could have mass mm-hmm. losses. Well, we had it, right? We had it with the pandemic and it didn't happen. And so to me, you take that knowledge and go back and say, see, like, look at in these markets and these things that we did and the way we underwrote mm-hmm. using AI, using all this extra data actually served us well because we focused on the customer and that risk situation independently and didn't mm-hmm. necessarily like look at it as this overall book, where are the, you know, pieces in there. And so I think that's really helped the industry kind of see that, that there weren't these, you know, 50%, 40% losses in the book when people weren't working. So, yeah, when, yeah, that, that was a pretty, pretty disruptive moment. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> that we all went through. Yeah. And do you see that as like an ongoing, it feels to me like the, the, the dialogue you're discussing is a, not a one time, Hey, we're going to, change everything here. It's a ongoing iterate and learn kind of process, particularly in engaging with your risk and governance groups inside the institution. Can you talk a little about how you, how you manage that and bring them along on the journey? Cause I think that's such a core part of this. And I guess there's a the perspective, like we're going to digital transformation is like we flip the switch and then we're done. So we got to get everybody on board on day one. And it feels like what you're describing is a more long-term iterative, hey, we're going to go and, and try something here and we're going to learn and we're going to show and we're going to get comfort and we're going to come back and maybe try something else somewhere else. Um, so I'd love for you to kind of talk a little bit about how you think about managing those relationships on an ongoing basis and getting people from point A to point B in terms of looking at new ways of doing things. Yeah, you, you got to bring those partners in up front and, and even the regulators. I mean, you guys know you did that initially when you're launching your product, right? always having those ongoing conversations, but yeah, you kind of have to start out small. Like let's pick this piece of the business or, you know, kind of this lending part or this, Mm -hmm. um, you know, this savings account and let's see how that works and let's analyze the data and go through that. Um, you can also look at other third parties, right? We've bought portfolios to get comfortable with Mm. certain asset classes and and that's all data. You're looking at it, you're slicing, you're dicing it and you can get people comfortable from that perspective to say, Hey, look at their process. They use AI in their underwriting. They have, you know, digital straight through processing and, you know, look at what we see in the book and how it's performing. And Mm -hmm. I think that power in the performance, even if it's not yours and it's maybe an asset you own really helps get people there. You know, unsecured lending at, at the bank is pretty new. Um, we got it through one of our acquisitions. We had a portfolio mm-hmm. and then we ended up buying a couple more portfolios just to get a better understanding. Cause it's not to say our process and our risk controls are the best. Let's kind of see how others do it. Even though yeah. we kind of are getting that income and getting the asset to, to kind of develop how we're going to have these loans perform and process. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. There, 
the regulators are an interesting topic as well. We don't have to delve into those today. Yeah, that's a, bringing, that's a whole different them case, along. I, I know it's one of those areas too, where I find that most people would go, oh, yeah, if it's not my area. I don't want to talk too much because that's kind of a, a tightly managed relationship. You mentioned AI uh, and I had an earlier conversation today about cryptocurrency. I'm curious if there are technologies you're particularly excited about. I just, those are two that come to my mind when I go, what's, what's everybody talking about is the future of whatever. What are things that you're particularly excited about uh, in terms of their possible impact on the, the consumer lending space in the next, you know, you know not, not the next just one year, but the next five or 10 years in terms of having very large impacts? Uh, I think the blockchain, absolutely. And specifically their smart contracts. Imagine mm-hmm. that you can be using smart contracts for lending that are dynamic mm-hmm and use that part of that process and you just you you have that risk taken out of the 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 whole lending ecosystem i think is a huge deal um, for lenders and it's not easy to get there but the technology is there and i think that's going to be really really great to have in the future are you guys doing anything in smart contract it's certainly an area where i feel i feel like you know we're in one of the two sexy things in ai and i understand that really well and then i go to blockchain and I go, I feel like my level of understanding is a four out of 10 and I need to be more of an eight out of 10. Uh, so it's not my area of expertise, but I'm curious, are you like live in production, exploring, are there particular kinds of loans you think are going to be, you know, powered by blockchain or, or enabled by smart contracts sooner rather than later? Just kind of where you, where you see that going. Cause I, it's not an area where I feel particularly well informed, at least as of, that's why I was having conversations earlier today on blockchain. About it. Somebody help me get smarter. Yeah. So for, for us, it's, it's more conceptual right now, I'd say doing, doing some research. Right. But I, I think in, in a real estate secured type lending product, Mm. it really makes the most sense, um, to have that, um, you know, in the unsecured, it's pretty straightforward, but there's definitely a use case there. But yeah, I think once we're, when you look at the, really the real estate and all the specific pieces of that, and the collateral pieces to have that in the in the blockchain on the smart contract is going to be um, really powerful. All right, so you, you provided a new insight. I know we've talked about blockchain and real estate lending before, so bar cleared for the day. Something cool. new, new, innovative, and interesting. I appreciate it. Um, has there been anything you've done recently where you've been surprised by what was turned out? Like any kind of projects or things where you went, "Huh, that didn't that didn't go the way we thought," and we learned something interesting from that? Uh, yeah, actually. So we just um, launched a digital application for consumer lending. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing fancy, kind of an out of the box thing. Um, yep. As we're kind of looking at our digital journey, it's, it was more for me to kind of gather data, like how our customers going to react. Um, but one thing we did is link it into the online banking. And okay. we got so many more applications than I expected from that. And, and there was no no marketing, no nothing. It literally is just in a drop down apply here for for a consumer loan on the mobile app, uh, on the app, or when you're logging into your like online banking, you right? In? Okay. And it, it's only been a few weeks, and just the amount of volume that's come through that channel um, is pretty surprising. Of people just self serving, like, oh hey, yeah, I do need this personal loan or whatever, right? It's not the ideal situation because I want it to be product agnostic, but at yeah. least that digital front end, I was really surprised that our customer base did that and took the initiative to just apply through there without any, without any push. Without any prompting or, oh, that yeah. is interesting. People just kind of take it upon themselves. I do, the, the theme, if there's been any of my recent conversations on this front is the, the shift of more conversations to advisory versus administrative and processing in nature. Yep. And then the willingness of post that kind of decision or conversation for the consumer to self-serve the process part, right? We've usually handheld the process and assume they came in with the advice or knowledge of what they wanted. And, and I'm kind of hearing the inverse is we want to help people figure out what they need. And then they're very happy to go home and pick up their phone and like fill out. They don't need me sitting there watching them put their, like I've definitely been there put, pulling your name in the form going, why are you watching me right. do this? I don't, I don't, I don't need to be observed. So I think that's kind of a shift of the priorities that's interesting. It, it kind of matches your unexpected levels of adoption of self-service. People are, people are happy to do that once they know what it is they're looking for. And if you can help them find that, then. I yeah, think that's, that's exactly kind of right. We, we empower our bankers that are, are in the branches to have those conversations and then just email a link. Like we don't have to go through all that piece. Like that's, 
Mm-hmm. Now we know and we know that you want a home equity loan. You can go at any time at your leisure and go ahead and apply, right? And that's powerful yeah. too. That's taking them out of those administrative tasks that they're sitting there having to do, yeah, yeah. plug it all in and giving the customer the choice to say, hey, I can go do it later, but at least now I know what I want. I know the fees. I know the, the rates or, you know, I know how it's all structured. So what feedback I, I've heard some hesitance to this idea of like, I came into the branch, I figured out what I wanted in conversation. Now I'm being sent out to finish my application on a phone, on a link, on my personal device versus the need that I hear from some institutions to like, no, once that person's in branch and they've expressed an interest in the product, I got to like, I got to finish that here. Have you had any feedback or results in that concept of like sending a link and allowing them to complete the process on their own from the consumers, from the bankers? Because it makes a lot of sense to me, but at the same time, I definitely hear some hesitancy around, you know, stuff slipping out, slipping through the cracks because they're either walking out of the branch or you're not having the banker finish the process. You're giving them a link and they're finishing on their own personal phone in the branch and you go, man, I've lost control of that process. What's your experience been on that front? Because I think it's a, it's a sensible model for how you transition from in store to you know, in branch start to, to at home finish. But I can also understand the concern for people who are used to finishing the process right there, sitting across the table. You know, I want to close this deal and, and being nervous about letting go of the control that comes with letting the, the consumer kind of self serve for the end of the process. Yeah, I think it, it goes back. You know, it's it's pretty early in our our mm. you know, kind of digital evolution around that. But what I would say is the the quality that comes through that kind of experience mm-hmm. is much higher than self-serving, right? Because they already, mm-hmm. you already know about them and you have that information. So yeah, yeah. to me, it, it actually is a better experience. And I don't really think of it as like, oh, I got them right there. I need to get them up the door. That That's kind of not the way we want to have our sales experience yeah. be eventually. Now, we're obviously not there yet, but like I talked about, it's not just like, oh, you need a home equity or you need an unsecured. It's like, what is your true need in, in the current you know, point you're in in your life or whatever you're trying to accomplish. And if they want to go back and do that later, or they're, you know, they're just, they just came to drop off a deposit. We we don't really care. And if they go away and they decide they don't need it, then that's a good experience too. They thought it over and they researched it, but to, to say, Oh, I've got you. And they're they're in the branch and apply now um, that, that that's not going to be our approach going forward. Might have to do that with the auto loans. You can't let them drive off the car off the lot. That's true. true. uh, Absolutely. You know, for the rest of it, that makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) Well, is there anything you wanted to cover today that I didn't ask? I feel like we've covered a good amount of ground here, but um, was there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't, uh, that we didn't hit on? Uh, I don't think so. I just, you know, it's really exciting time to be in lending and just, you know, what's, yeah. I'm, I'm, I've been in lending for a pretty good amount of time and to actually see these technologies and these things that we can leverage is, is really cool. And just having all these, you know, partners that we can work with and, and, mm. and identify how we can make that process better and make that lending as quick and as seamless and frictionless as possible is, is really cool. So I'm excited for that, for the future. I've got my normal three closing questions, but you just made me think of one more. When you think about people you can partner with and different ways to build digital experience. How do you think about evaluating the need to have that kind of, I mean, if it's tough if you have five partners to deliver the seamless experience that already knows what you know about somebody in all these different stacks. How do you think about the, the value of one partner that does a lot of stuff for you in a way that's better integrated versus different partners that may solve different problems and how you evaluate the ability to kind of integrate that consumer experience or at least bring the data I think is maybe the most valuable part, the data that you already have into those experiences. So you're giving that frictionless, seamless experience to the consumer, no matter which technology partner you might be leveraging for a particular product. I'm curious how you think about that, because it feels like one of the flies in the ointment um, for this kind of, hey, I've got lots of people I can partner with, but if I want to have a unified data and experience, like those two things seem a little bit at odds. And I'm curious how you how you resolve that in your own mind or your own approach. Yeah, I I don't think a one-stop shop is what consumers want today, right? I mean, just think of how many apps you have on your phone and no one has a problem to go to their Chase app or their, you know, their mortgage app or their other, you know, no, no one has that problem. No one's like, ah, I need to kind of see everything in there. I think that's kind of next level too. If you can, like you say, you build that foundational level of data and then you have these partners that are part of that, that you can kind of you know, either put in that experience or, hey, we have online banking, but they can kind of see all these other things that they may be 
signed up for or maybe something that we're trying to you know solve for them so it, to, to me it's a one-stop shop i think is a is an old way of thinking the consumers mm-hmm. of today and tomorrow they don't they, they don't necessarily need that all in one place and there's there's a lot of aggregators out there that do that yeah. um and and services that you can hey you know through plaid or through whatever kind of add your bank account and add your investment accounts and take a look at that so yep yeah Got it. Well, if you've listened to the podcast, which you say you have, you know that I end these all with the same three questions. So I'll fire at them, uh, fire you at, at these at you now. Uh, what's the best pre- piece of career advice you've ever gotten? Okay, there's two. I had to pick two because I couldn't. Two, I couldn't two's choose. fine. Two's fine. Okay, but um, the first one is always bring solutions. So if always bring issue, solutions. Yeah, if you're having an issue or a problem, never just bring that. Never bring that to the table. Always start with the solution. What's the problem? Here are the things I thought might work and that we can resolve this issue or this problem, mm-hmm. really be problem solving. That, that, that's what this all, is all about. All right, always um, bring a solution. Number two? Yeah. I think the other one is, is um, you have to own your career because nobody else cares. Um, that's a big thing. A little thing. harsh. HR would argue with you right? on that point. But, but the meaning is, is that you, know, you can do a good job. You can get all your tasks done. You can feel like, hey, I, I, I'm great at my job. I do really good. But if you don't have that relationship or your manager doesn't know or your boss doesn't know or your team doesn't know that you're doing those things, you, you might not get the next opportunity or the next project. Mm-hmm. So you have to be proactive in your career, even if it's about the things that you're doing and what you're kind of focused on so that everyone knows and then, then thinks, oh, hey, um, Jeff did that really good thing and I'm going to bring him into this next project, right? If you're sitting with your head down, kind of just plugging away at the spreadsheets, that's never going to happen. And those ex- experiences and opportunities aren't going to be afforded to you. To be clear that Jeff did that really good thing is clearly a fictionalized story. Right. That's never actually <laughs> right. But uh, no, that's great. Be proactive in managing your career. I think it's, it's very true. And people, I know big companies used to have like career tracks where you kind of got in the groove and you were just going to get to the end place. But I, I agree. With you. I don't think that's very much true anymore. And if you're not actively looking for the other opportunities, asking for the opportunities and making sure people know what you're looking for and what you've been contributing. You're probably not, it doesn't just fall on your lap. We've talk, got, I got young kids and I keep telling them, you gotta like, gotta ask for what you want. And you gotta be proactive and going after exactly it. Not right. just gonna like, not just gonna come to you cause you, why this is what I really wanted. Well, yeah, yeah. Did you go for it? Cause it's, right. not, it's not gonna come to you. Did you ask right, for it too? Yeah. That's right. What's the best piece of uh, career, or oh, sorry, consumer lending or, or consumer banking advice you've ever heard? Um, this, we talked about earlier, but, and we've talked a lot about data, right? But lending is data, everything, every piece of lending, even back, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it's all about what data do I have on the customer? What data do I have on the collateral? What data do I have on the risk and how you bring those together and make the right decision and problem solve Mm -hmm. for the customer. Right. And, and then it's even on the back end, right? All like secondary trading or whole loan trading, all your trading is data data and information. And to me, that's the biggest thing I've ever gotten in lending is like, that's how you have to look at it. Man, if it and if lending is data, then, then he with the best data, data infrastructure and data processing ultimately has an advantage. Absolutely. He or she, I should say, I'm going to get in trouble if I say he, but the institutions that can best leverage the data are going to be those in, the, in position to, to make the best decisions. And the last question, what's one bold prediction for the future? So this one's lending specific and, All right. um, it's really real estate lending will be as fast as unsecured lending. Real estate lending will be as fast. I've talked yeah. to people in HELOC that are trying to get down to 20 days and you know, we got unsecured in 20 minutes. Real estate will be as fast as, as unsecured. That's a, I, I go with you to you. Are, that is a bold prediction. It uh, is absolutely bold, but I, 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 I'm confident it will happen. I definitely am. It's going to be a while, but it will. All right. I like that. That's a good, bold prediction to end on. Real estate lending will be as fast as unsecured lending. Uh, I hope so, because uh, we're we, we like fast. It certainly would be good for the 